Hello my game design gurus, and welcome to the Level Design Lobby. Hey everyone, hope you're doing well. You're joining me, your host, Max Pears. I'm a professional level designer, here to talk about level design and game design, breaking down theories, reading materials, and much more. So thank you for joining me, and I hope you are playing and or making the games that you love. So welcome guys to the 13th episode. And like all episodes, this is special. But this has a unique reason on why it's special. Because this episode is the kickoff of a mini-series. Now, what I mean by a mini-series is this is going to be part one of a two to four part episodes where I break down a game and break down things that I like about this game and it's solely focusing just on this one game and this one game alone. So you may be wondering, well, what is the game, Max? Well, I'm glad you've asked because it is, drumroll, <laughs> Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Now some of you may have heard me speak about this before briefly in previous episodes and I'm a huge fan of this game. Honestly, it has now made itself into my favorite games of all time. I'm not the biggest Zelda fan. I was really into uh, Twilight Princess. I played Ocarina of Time and that was decent, but Breath of the Wild has just grabbed me and I, I can't put it down. And when every time I get a moment to game, I jump on that quickly. Just side note, the Switch is awesome. I do worry about its longevity, but right now, the Switch is awesome, and because I travel a fair bit, it's just brilliant. I used to play my Vita all the time, but Switch, phew. Anyway, that's not a paid endorsement or anything. I'm just really into it. So, the breakdown of Zelda, as I said, this is going to be a multi-part series, but this is the first part. And what I want to talk about in this first part of my mini-series of Zelda is creative growth as a player. And what do I mean by that? So... The summary of this episode about it is if you play most games we end up growing normally it's the character that grows through the playthrough from the beginning where you start with weaker weapons and armor to the very end where you may be overpowered with this new awesome destructive weapon or this deadly combo that you've unlocked and this is just normal this is normal progression in games but zelda does it very differently and it does it amazingly because it's not about Link growing so much. He does have some some parts where he grows, but it's you as the player and your play style that is forced to grow. And I'm going to be breaking down how they do it, how they do this in the game, why it's really interesting, and why I think it's important to us as game designers, level designers moving forward. Because I didn't notice this at first until, man, I don't know how many hours in. I must have spent one hour chasing 10 crickets for a side quest. And I still enjoyed it despite chasing those 10 crickets. I got them, but I loved every second of it. Is it uses certain techniques to help you grow as a player and making you think differently and play differently. Metal Gear Solid 5 does something similar, but we'll talk about Metal Gear Solid as a whole other topic later. Now that I've given you guys a brief summary on what this episode's about, we're just going to jump right into it and start talking about these things. Just before we jump into this though, this will contain some mild spoilers. Not necessarily for story, but it will give some things away. So if you haven't played it, it's not major spoilers or story or anything, but it will give some things away. So if you want to play the game and come back, I recommend you do that. But if you just want to hear about the amazing design techniques behind it, then please stick around for this one. The first thing it does in helping you grow as a player is it gives you basically all the tools from the get-go. So when you start, you wake up and you speak to this old man. And this old man has a task for you where you have to unlock, unlock the power of the Sheikah Slate, which is basically like a, an iPad in, in their fantasy world. And you have to unlock these f four, four or five powers to it, which, which are bombs. You get these in two shapes. One is a sphere and one is a cube. You have the magnet power, where you can connect with certain items and lift them and manipulate them through the power of a giant magnet. Freezing power, where if there's water, you can freeze uh, freeze waters to raise them up as platforms. The lock power, where you hold certain objects and items in position. And these are the main powers that you get. There is certain ones you unlock later, like the camera mode and amiibos if you have them. 
but they're not the ones I want to focus on. You unlock, and these are the main ones you unlock at the beginning of the game. While, like I said, most other games, they give you a certain amount of mechanics and abilities at the beginning. They're limiting you because it is easier to balance and it's also easier to teach the player with a limited amount of sources. And then when you can go pull off the cooler stuff, it makes you feel like you have grown because of this. Zelda does it slightly differently by giving you everything. But what helps reflect that is the level design. When you are given these powers, you're not just giving them out of the blue. You have to go attend these um, these shrines, which are kind of the mini puzzles which unlock things called spirit orbs. We'll talk about them and their use a little bit later on in the episode. And these shrines are great, these beginning ones especially, because they give you the basic rundown they, and they give you enough space as well to experiment. It's not so linear. Well, it is linear, but... It's quite a lot of open space for you to just muck around and try different things just because the powers are really cool. And then after that, this is where it gets really, really, pardon my language, fucking smart. Because what happens is once you've done this, you now have the entire world to explore. I think that is really done on purpose and is a really, really intelligent decision by their designers. Because... As I said, you've now been given all this power and you have unlimited, well, limited to a degree, but an absolute ton of space to try these things with a range of different types of environments and areas with water, high mountains, lava, just so much cool stuff. And it's all for you just to experiment with because you are... <laughs> almost literally forced off a cliff when you get this like pushed off for you to go and mess around with because you glide down you do have some some quests to do but really if you want to go face the last boss in this game with what you had at the point and even if it's with a mop you could go do that now you're probably going to die and fail there has been some people who've done this but it still gives you the freedom to do that as it gives you the freedom the player to mess around with all these abilities with anything in any order that you want. So again, not only does it give you the abilities at the beginning, but it also gives you the chance to experiment with them in this open world. So next time when you give an ability, think of it like this. This is kind of thing that I try to focus on in terms of introducing mechanics, especially in, in an open world game, is where you give it to them, sorry, where you give the mechanic to the player, that's better English, you show them some cool stuff but you do not show them everything. You give them an understanding. And then when you release them to the open world, for example, say this is it for a different game, a player is unlock a mechanic in a mission, and this mission takes place in a certain district of an area. The player receives that mechanic in the mission, they're shown some cool stuff, but not the coolest stuff. And then when they come into this district, this open world area, the player now has a chance to use this item because they've now seen certain objects that meant nothing to them before receiving the mechanic but now means a new path a new ability because of the mechanic and it's your job especially with the open world to give the player a chance to have the best experience with the mechanic in this world in the open world in my opinion and i've gone off topic i can't remember what i was saying because of that so <laughs> i hope that was informative um now we're going to move on to another way that they encourage creative growth in players. So that is through the encounters. Now, every open world has these sort of like random encounters or just an enemy base. And Zelda Breath of the Wild is no different. You see these sort of goblins or lizard people. And I'm sure there are people listening to this who are raging at me for not knowing their actual name other than goblins and lizard people because I know that's not the correct Zelda terminology. And to the fans... I apologize. You run into their little encampments. And if you notice about these encampments, they are placed in certain positions with certain items to encourage players to experiment. Now, for example, one base might take place right next to a lake. So you can use that freezing power to create a maybe a flanking route to get the drop on the enemies that you just make around the back of the camp with the, with the water. Or you can use that to create a higher vantage point to take them take them out from the top of this pillar and 
making sure that they can't reach you with the, their short range weapons only using long range weapons instead. So that's really clever because you don't have to do that. I know for a long time when I was playing this game, I just ran in with my sword, spear and bows and bow and arrows and I was like, yeah, I feel cool. And it wasn't until I started to notice these patterns with these encounters that it was trying to tell me other things to experiment with. Another example is in this one base, there are these metal boxes, these metal crates that the player cannot smash. But you can use them to pick you can use them to be picked up with your magnet ability to either drop in an enemy, push them off maybe a cliff or something, and just beat them senseless with it. Or maybe you can pile it up for again a high vantage point on top of crates on top of one another. And it wasn't until after I'd I'd beaten some of these encounters that I realized, oh, I can actually use these in creative ways. I'm not gonna lie, I felt really stupid and really just not creative. I started to doubt myself because I wasn't killing the enemies in cool ways. But it does this enough so that you can come back and look at this. Because you can come back to these because of something called the Blood Moon, which respawns all the enemies that you've killed from, from your previous encounters with them. So again, another smart decision because the things you may have learned from this you can now reapply it to the encampment that you might come across again again really clever on that one moving on to the next point with these encounters oh well, hold on i just want to give another one they also can put the uh, encampments at the bottom of a hill so that players can just chuck bombs off and blow things up again for each power there is a way for you to use use it in these enemy encampments. And this moves on to the next point, which is they don't overload these encounters with a solution for every mechanic, which is brilliant. Because one of the problems is, is players want choice, and we as designers must and must give players choice. But there is a thin line of choice and just overwhelming the player to having no idea what to do or where to go so they have looking at it i'm just guessing here but it looks like they have a hard rule of only two two mechanical solutions at maximum in the encounter space i haven't completed all of zelda so there might be more but just the amount that i've played which is oh, i don't even know like over 20 hours or something i've only noticed that there are a maximum of two solutions as i said the metal boxes but that can be in the same encampment next to the water. So again, it's not overloading the player. It is up to them to choose. And that's fantastic. And like I said, you don't have to do this. You can just go in with your sword and shield. But to me, that is an incredibly smart decision for not overloading or, overbear or overburdening players with choice. Because they know there's going to be that many encounters around the open world that each mechanic is going to get its chance to shine that the player is going to learn and master each mechanic at their own pace at their own time so to sum up that point the encounters they have the basic combat encounters which can take roughly between 30 seconds and two minutes encourage players to play smart to grow their creativity if you will through giving players choices but not overburdening them i've just been messaged on facebook Thank you, Facebook. So next time you're making a mechanic, think about your encounters. Does it encourage that growth? And that's the best thing, is most games that do it the, the more traditional sense, not all games, but most, they give you space, but they don't encourage you to always use that new mechanic, or they do only for a set amount of time, because you then get a new mechanic, and they focus on teaching that mechanic, and then making you master that mechanic, as then a new mechanic comes on. And if the designers are really great, they'll then do a combination of mechanics. But this here, because you have everything at the beginning, it allows the designers to take their time and to give you a chance to explore these mechanics through their encounters. Now we're going to revisit the topic of shrines. As I mentioned to you earlier, for you to unlock these mechanics that you get at the beginning, you have to complete these small shrine challenges to, to get them, which again is a teaching ground, a tutorial space for the player. And these shrines are scattered all around all around the map, and you have to go find them. 
which is great and we're going to talk about exploration in, in Zelda in this, this, this mini series here but, but, but stumbling on my words and the shrines are great for a reason that they are a good reminder of what the player can do with these mechanics and a combination of the mechanics so if the player hasn't been or you haven't been using your mechanics the shrines will always remind you hey don't forget to try out this cool this cool power that you have and they always do it in good and exciting ways and then they also allow players to combine the mechanics as well it's sometimes the shrine will just be dedicated to one mechanic and sometimes it'll be dedicated to a multitude of mechanics and that's brilliant because it goes back to the similar thing of the design layouts it allows players to experiment it allows players to see these mechanics in basically all its glory in a safe space primarily safe there is some enemies that you do fight in uh, in some in some of these shrines and just a good reminder as well it doesn't have something or someone like navi being like hey link try out your freeze power that was my best Navi impression as well. I may be moving into voice acting. Nola North, watch out. <laughs> it's a great reminder for that because no one's telling you. You are being shown that these are important. You are being told again to complete these. You need to use mecha- You need to use these mechanics. You need to use your head and think creatively to solve these puzzles. Which then I believe they are hoping that you, the player then take with you to the open world experience to try out these encounters to try and help you with the exploration as well not just only with the combat but exploration as well so to sum up that point as well shrines are used as a friendly reminder they're not in your face they are showing you through gameplay not through text not through video or not through alert the best way in my opinion to show players what they need to do or give them a nudge is with in-game experience not with a novel that's a separate topic but i'm really passionate about teaching players the right way and this it may not be fully teaching but it's reminding the players in my opinion in the most exciting way possible by giving them something cool to experience with gameplay okay now we're going to move on to my final point on how this game forces you as a player to grow encourages you to play sometimes out of your own element so this one is on breakable weapons. Um, as you know with this game, that the weapons you have, you don't really have for long. After you use a certain weapon for X amount of hits, depending on the weapon, it will then break and you'll have to either use another weapon that you have in your, in your inventory or you'll have to quickly find a weapon. Now at first, I don't really think much of this. I know some people, when they first play the game, found this rather frustrating and didn't know how to react to it. And when I got it, I thought it was interesting. Like, just I just thought, okay, it's, it's different to most games. Like, this isn't the first game to have breakable weapons. There's other ones. But it's the first one where it doesn't actually have your durability, like, as a, a visual percentage. You only know when it's badly damaged because some text alerts you to the player. And the reason why it forces the player to grow is because is because of that reason. You're only really alerted to it when it's in really bad shape. You're not keeping eyes on the stats of your weapon so you can plan out how to use it. And then what it does also upon this is within a few minutes, you as the player could be left with, no, with nothing, with no weapons. So you have to quickly run around and try to find a weapon. And... This is a great way to encourage you to play differently. What do I mean by this? I mean, for example, I'm not a huge fan of two-handed claymores in in this game. My my timing's off with it. It's not the best for me personally. Your defense isn't as strong, you know, when I play, and that's why I prefer to use either spears or a one-handed sword with a shield. That's how I prefer to play. But because the weapons break, I might have to quickly find a two-handed sword and quickly learn how to fight with that, figure out the timing on the go. And this all comes back to making the player learn and forcing them to play in a different style that they they may not have done prior to this. And that's the really genius thing about these breakable weapons. As I said, it's not the first game to have this. However... 
them hiding the percentage or the stats about how damaged your weapon is plays into, as I just said, making the player grow and making them ha- re- forcing them into choosing a playstyle they may not enjoy with this breakable weapon. Because now you only have to have on you what you have to survive. You may only have a leaf. I've had a combat situations where I had a sword, it broke, and the only thing in my inventory was either a stick or a leaf. And that would have to force me to use the, the leaf to push the enemies back so I can chuck a bomb at them. Again, at the time it may be like, oh man, why has this happened to me? God, I hate breakable weapons. But really, it's super smart on the design because now it's forcing you to think on the spot on how to deal with the situation, which is actually like a real fight. You have to think how you're going to attack your opponent, see where where their guards down. Do they only attack with the hands? Maybe you just kick out their legs. But martial arts, that's another passion of mine. That's another thing. But it's very similar to that. In you have to figure out with what you have. Now again, this you can kind of go around this at one point once you get enough enough weapons which suit your playstyle. You don't necessarily have to pick up the weapons you don't like after that. But sometimes you can't find any of the weapons that you enjoy. So it forces you as a player, again, to have to be at least have a basic understanding of each weapon type, of their timing, of their speed, of their defense. The reason I don't like two-handed weapons is I was against one of those... Uh, Man, again, I'm going to upset some fans here. But it's those, like, those ninjas that drop the bananas. And they're really fast opponents. And I had a two-handed, two-handed sword, a claymore. I just couldn't hit them. And because they were so fast, this power weapon that I had was just useless against them. I'm sure other people will have known how to use it correctly. But like I said, I, I really wasn't accustomed to it. And I died because of me not understanding the timing, the pacing, one of the enemy, and two of the weapon. But because I had no choice, because I didn't have any other weapons other than this claymore, because I I destroyed all the hammers, and I destroyed my one-handed swords when trying to fight them, it left me no choice but to use this. Okay, I may have died in this instant, but again, really, really smart on how they've done this. Because it all comes back to making you grow as a player, not Link growing. So to sum that point, because the weapons are breakable, it forces the player out of their comfort zone. It makes them have to have a basic understanding and to study and learn the weapon choice that are given to them. Not the ones they choose, but the ones that they have left available to them. And to me, when you think about this, not just a breakable weapon system, but this as a whole, The breakable weapon system is a part of all this, and yet it's another way to reinforce the player to grow as a player. So guys, that really that really is my main points upon this and how this how Zelda Breath of the Wild really makes you pay attention, really gives you the chance to grow as the player, not just watch your character grow to this overpowered beast you know entering beast mode so maybe at the end you might become op i'm still very much you know part way through my journey of this but i really want to share the passion and the design techniques that i'd seen from this game on how it focuses on making you the player grow not the character link grow but let's just go through these points one more time just to sum up so you know like nothing's been missed so the first thing they do is they give you all the main mechanics at the beginning of the game. All of these are now exposed so you can use them whenever you want. Then they use the correct level design to encourage and give the freedom of you, the player, to experiment with this. By having an open world, they allow you to grow and have as much time as you want to play around. Next is the design encounters. Each encounter is set up in a way where Yes, you have the baseline of, of solving these areas with just going in and attacking, but you also have the chance to use your mechanics and it gives hints to the player on how they, on how they should use them by having certain setups for certain mechanics. In these encounters, they have just up to a maximum of two methods 
two mechanical methods to solve this so they don't overwhelm the players. Next thing is the shrines. Now the shrines is used as a constant reminder of the cool stuff you can do with those mechanics. So again, constantly hinting, don't forget about these mechanics, you can use them through gameplay as well. That's a really underlying point here. They're reminding you with gameplay, not with a notification, not with a novel of text. They are reminding you with gameplay. And the final one is the breakable weapons. This doesn't work with mechanics, but it is again helping you grow as a player because you're left with an uncomfortable position where you have to use what's available to you. You don't have anything that you've picked unless you again you've upgraded and you stocked up. But again, you have to use what's available to you because you can't get attached to a certain play style, a certain weapon, because eventually it will break. And again, another great way of it doing this is it hides the numbers, it hides the facts from the player. So you really are you're really unsure how many hits you get per weapon. So that's the summary of this episode. Again, I really hope you guys and girls have enjoyed this. This is a really fun one. And the best bit is it's only part one. I'm going to be working on the next part, which is part two of how it uses its traversal mechanics to encourage exploration. Which is exciting because part of having an open world is the exploration itself. Is encouraging players to explore. So I'll be talking about how it does this in part two of this series. So everyone, I really hope you have enjoyed this episode. If you've played Breath of the Wild and you want to talk to me about this episode and what you think Zelda also done well, please tweet me at Max Pears. For any feedback or criticism, then please email it over to me at leveldesignlobby at gmail.com. So yeah, please get in contact because it's a communication. It's a conversation between us. And the main thing, guys and girls, please subscribe. You know, this is really important to me because if I know people are wanting to hear this, then it makes sure that I know I'm doing the right thing. Because as fun as it is just to look into a mic and make terrible jokes, because, you know, this is the 13th episode, I, uh, I think we're all aware that I'm not really a comedian as much as I fool myself. <laughs> you know, it allows me to know that you guys are enjoying this and you're learning from it as well. All right, everyone. Take it easy, have a great weekend or week, depending when you're listening to this, and all the best. I can't wait to come back to you with the second part of this series. Alright guys, take care. See you later. Bye.